My name is Artem Gogin. I'm from Grid Dynamics, and I'm staff data engineer. And today we're going to talk about approaches to building a data warehouse nowadays. Um, to begin with, I want to ask you how many of you know what is data warehouse? Please raise your hand. So some people know. And then how many people know what big data is? Or just like familiar with big data? A, a, bit, a bit more. Uh, so you can, for those who don't know what data warehouse is, you can just treat it as approaches to building uh, big data nowadays. And anyway, I will explain what, what is what later. Uh, before we begin, a few words about my company, our company. Uh, our company is presented in 14 countries, and today Armenia is our area of focused growth. Uh, our engineers work as a contractors for such companies as Apple, Google, Nike, and so on. And we invite you to know more about our company on Expo Zone on the second floor today and tomorrow. Yeah, I will speak louder then. <laughs> no problem. Okay, let's talk about big data now. And our plan for today is we will start with what exactly a company, we will imagine an example company and we will see We will see what exactly a company may want to achieve from the data analytics. We will see how a company can deal with data analytics when it has small data and when its data is expanding. We will see how company, when the company needs data warehouse or data lake. And also we will see what approaches can a company choose to build its data platform analytics, uh, data analytics pl platform. Uh, we will see how the particular choice will affect the company processes, what are the circumstances, what are the consequences of the choice, and what are pros and cons of each approach. Uh, let's see how it all begins. Uh, I know you probably cannot see the picture too well, but I will explain what we can see on the picture in details. Uh, let's start with imagining a simple company. Uh, it can be any company, and almost any company has its website. And on the website, probably there are some tables, some information about its users. We can see it here. About clicks that users do on the website, and maybe the purchases. It's, it's presented here. And this picture will remain on, the, on all of my slides. So this purchases, users, and clicks will be all the same later. Uh, we can imagine that uh, any time user makes any action on the website, we get this information in our backend databases. These databases, it can be one database, it can be multiple databases, it can be SQL or no SQL compliant databases, but still, we just need to keep in mind that any time anything happens on the website, we get this information in backend database. Now let's imagine business stakeholders. And business stakeholders want usually to understand how the business, uh, how the business is going. And business wants to find probably some points of growth, how we can increase the revenue. To do this, we can imagine in our particular case, business may want to understand a conversion rate here. Uh, the conversion, rate, the conversion rate could help us understand how attractive our pictures and text are on the website. For the next metric, we can imagine a user involvement metric, which can help us check how many time user spends on the website and how deep user go in each section. And a third metric, we can imagine uh, user behavior metric. And this metric can help us understand how, how we can improve user experience and increase overall satisfaction. This is how it may 
look like. Uh, what is important here that it is a beautiful graphics uh, and it has all the important sums business stakeholder may want to see. So there is some diagram here, some uh, some calculation or already pre-calculated data here, some sums here, some history data, some map. So it looks beautiful and it, it should look fast for business stakeholder. That's what we are trying to achieve. So what is the problem? Why do we need to talk about how to build these beautiful dashboards from our databases? Because what we, what we saw Originally, we just had a backend database and then uh, business stakeholders. And in reality, it's not possible to build such dashboard with just backend databases because resources of the backend databases are usually taken by website users. So we cannot query these databases again, uh, except for website. Uh, usually, these backend databases does not, do not contain historical data. So we cannot query what happened two years ago, for, for, for instance. Also, usually backend databases are not optimized for full table reads. So we probably need some another database. Uh, also, backend databases are hard to read. So it's hard to read from multiple backend databases, especially uh, when all the databases are different, when some of them are SQL compliant and some of them are not. Uh, and the last backend database limit is uh, these databases should be highly available. So again, it's very risky to do any integrations with them, except for websites integrations. Uh, let's see how we can deal with such limitations. Uh, the first naive approach could be to build uh, separated analytical env environments. And here on the picture, we introduce our analytical database, separate analytical database. And uh, what we can see on the picture, we can see the same backend database, but now we have one more database for analytical purposes. Uh, and the purpose here, we can remove the history from backend database and transfer the, all the historical data to separate database where later, which we can later query to build our analytical dashboards. Uh, here I specify that we have a history of all of our backend data. So it's history of purchases, history of users, and history of clicks. And from this data, we can build some data marts. And data marts are pre-calculated data we need for dashboards. So basically, when we want to see beautiful graphics, beautiful metrics for business stakeholders. We want to query these tables called data marts. And why this? So one, once again, once again, what we want to achieve with this separated databases, database, analytical database. We want to separate resources. We want to collect all historical data. We want all of our users to be able to query this data marts and query all the historical data from one point, uh, ideally. And we want a fast environment to query our dashboards. That's our goal. But <clears throat> in reality, that's not possible again. Because uh, we ideally want to achieve easy and fast queries in our analytical database. And in reality, that's not possible because usually we need to choose. Do we want fast read or fast a convenient write from database? And that's not possible when we talk about big data. And uh, uh, yeah, that's both are not possible when we talk about big data. We only need to choose one. Uh, the second, our expectation is, is we want our data to be easy to understand. Uh, and to do this, we probably want to keep our data as is, so in raw format, just like it looks in backend database. And in reality, if we want to store data as is, uh, so it's called raw data, so if we want to store raw data, which is easy to understand, it will take a lot of resources which will be too expensive for a single database. And the third expectation, we want our data to appear immediately to build our report fast uh, and 
In reality, that's also not possible because usually we need some time to transfer the data to separate database and then to build a dashboard. So, what actually works in reality? Let's see how we can deal with such problems with first realistic approach which we can see in real life. And the first approach called data warehouse and how and on the picture you can see how it looks like. We can see the same backend database, but now the difference is we add a staging layer and except of historical data, we add a normalized historical data. Uh, so it's not an original data, it's uh, normalized, some, uh, some, transformed, some transformed data, which now doesn't look like original raw data. Uh, let's talk about let's talk about the staging area we have here. So how it how it looks in reality. We start from backend database. We transfer the data to staging area. In staging area, we change the model of our tables, and then we upload these tables to in normalized way to data warehouse. Uh, now we are able to we are, we are able to keep the SQL compliance with this normalized table. We also able to have only one database and skip all the normalized history in the database because it doesn't take so much space. And we are able to build the same data marts and also query them fast because we have SQL compliance with, within our data warehouse database. Uh, let's see what are the pros of this approach. The first one is we are finally able to store our history and remove our history. We are able to store our history and analytical database and we are able to remove our history from backend database. So we can free resources from our backend and we have a separate environment for the data warehouse. Our data is normalized, so it's space and query efficient. We can still build the data marts pretty efficient and also it, this data doesn't take much space. Uh, this environment is SQL friendly, we have fast queries in this environment, and we have only one database to query from. But there are a few drawbacks for this approach. The first one is old, uh, the first one is we firstly need to understand the requirements and only then we can upload our data to data warehouse. So we firstly work with requirements and then we work with uploading data. It means if new requirements comes later, we still miss the history for, for this data because we, if we don't have such requirements, we don't upload this data to data warehouse. Uh, the next drawback is normalizing brings consistency issue because uh, it requires a lot of manip data manipulation when we normalize the table and when we upload the tables to data warehouse in a normalized way. So there are there can be some consistency issue because does data doesn't look the same and there can be some errors in the data. Normalizing the third drawback is normalizing brain depends oh, sorry normalizing demands a lot of engineering work because it's not so easy to normalize each table to change its data model and to upload it to data warehouse. The same for analytical work when we want to query the data. It's not always easy to understand how to query this data properly, how to join all the tables, so it also can take time. Uh, this, the next drawback, it's very hard to fix a mistake uh, when the data already loaded. It's hard to understand that there is a mistake and if we understood we uploaded the data uh, in the wrong way, there is a great possibility we cannot fix the mistake without removing all the history because if the history is wrong, we don't have data anymore to restore the data in the right way. Sorry. Uh, the next drawback is uh, if we want to add a new source, a new table, we need to spend a lot of time and, and a lot of effort to upload the new source, new tables to this data warehouse. And the last drawback is if we pick our wrong approach for normalization, if we pick wrong data modeling, all of our architecture can become very expensive. And maybe one day we, can, we may want to redo all the things because one, with one new requirement, all the structure can, be, can become inefficient. 
few words about what approaches can we take for data normalization and data modeling. I won't dive into each of them, but if you will ever deal with data warehouse, you may want to, you probably will face these approaches and uh, it's Kimball approach, Inman approach and couple of data vaults approach. Uh, usually, a Kimball and Inman approach are considered as legacy and pretty old schools, but you may still see them sometimes while the data is not very, uh, it's not very big. And for and the most modern one is data vault approach, which can fit really a lot amounts of data, but also requires a lot of effort. And in real life, we can face some solutions, uh, like the most popular one is Snowflake right now. Also, you, we may see such solutions as Teradata, Vertica, Greenplum, and Oracle Exadata. If, any, if, you, if you see or choose any of these databases, then probably it's a data warehouse approach and it looks exactly like this. So, is there anything else we can choose to get rid of normalization and, uh, and still keep all the history and build our data analytics. Uh, the second one is, the second approach is combination of data lake and data warehouse. And on a picture, you can see how this schema looks like. Uh, we see new data lake layer and we also see the old one data warehouse or BI level. It's, let's start with data warehouse or BI level. We have the, the same database as we, as, we has, as we had previously, but now we use them just for data marts. Data marts are pretty slow, so we don't have any, uh, uh, any issues with these databases being too expensive because we don't need much space for them. They are still SQL compliant, they are fast, so our business stakeholders still work with convenient environments. Uh, but for the historical data, Again, you probably don't see it quite well, but here it's mentioned history of purchases, history of users, and history of clicks. And now uh, the idea is we don't need normalization to store these histories uh, in our data lake, because right now we use separated resources for our data lake. Uh, what are the advantages of this approach? Uh, we can access our historical raw data and we can store our data in original form. So in raw, uh, we can store raw data. Uh, this data is easy to upload uh, and it's also easy to understand. Uh, the next advantage is everyone now can implement raw data processing. So we don't need to rely on someone else's logic. Someone else, all responsibility are on us. We can achieve our raw data, we can query and we can uh, we can perform any anal analytics we want. Uh, it's also easy to find and fix any mistake if we uploaded history in the wrong way, because history usually uploads as this, one to one, so there are usually, there are no, usually no mistakes, but still, uh, if something goes wrong, it's easy to understand if something went wrong, because we can just check the sums immediately after processing, and because data should look one to one, it's easy to find any issue. Uh, and the last advantage is not required data yet is never lost because now we can keep all the history if there are is requirements or if there is no requirement because it's pretty cheap and we and we shouldn't need to care and we shouldn't care about if there was requirement and someone is ready, if someone waits for this data already or someone may want to use this data later. So we can just upload this data to data lake and deal with this data later. Now let's see what are the drawbacks of this approach. The first one, this approach required, uh, demands data government to not forget about uploaded data. Again, it's so easy to upload data to data lake. So it's, there is a great possibility to forget, uh, to upload and forget about this data. So when I talk about data gov governance, I mean uh, looking for metadata, documentations, listing all of our sources, and uh, also we need to support descriptions for each, for each source. Uh, the next disadvantage 
is each, uh, this approach takes more time to pro process each date because data lake is cheap but not so fast. And also if you want to store all the data from all the sources and in original form, it takes more time, more resources, but the resources are cheap by themselves. So that's not about the money, it's about the time. So probably we need a couple of times, couple of hours to upload each, uh, each table. Uh, the next drawback is it demands complicated infrastructure. Uh, and if we pick wrong, uh, wrong technologies, wrong infrastructure, wrong servers, this technology, this, this approach uh, quickly becomes too expensive. So for it to be expensive, it requires a lot of right infrastructure, a lot of right, a lot of right technologies. Uh, the next drawback is usually there is no SQL compliance for historical data because there is usually no SQL compliance in backend databases. And because we keep uh, all, of, all of the data as is in original structure, it means we also do, don't have SQL compliance when we in data lake. We only have SQL compliance in data warehouse. Uh, and the last drawback is a new GDPR policies uh, which require additional uploading logic. Uh, in few words, GDPR requires us to not keep too many information about each user, to not keep many personal data. And also like one of the policy, if, if, if a user want to delete, wants to delete an account, we also need to delete all of the information about the user. So companies don't have permissions to store uh, information about deleted users. Uh, it means we sometimes need to clean our history and there are a few approaches how to do it easily with GDPR to follow GDPR policies. So it brings a little, uh, a little difficulties, but still it's all doable. And real life data lake examples could be Hadoop for storage or any, or, so for storage we in real life, we use any distributed file system. So for on-premise servers, it's Hadoop, and if you work in cloud, it's any uh, distributed storage depending on your cloud. Uh, for querying the data, we also need additional tool, and the most popular one is Spark, and also Hive works, with, uh, works great with combination, in combination with Spark, so Hive and Spark are the most popular technologies. And also there is a possibility to add real-time analytics for the data lake, and uh, for the data lake, we, for the real-time analytics, we need to bring some new technologies like Kafka, Cassandra, or maybe Flink. Once again, in a nutshell, two approaches and uh, the difference between each of them. For data warehouse, uh, the most difficult and complicated part is normalization within each staging area. But when we are done with normalization, uh, building the data marts and working within the data working within data warehouse uh, are pretty convenient because there is it's fast. It has all the SQL. The only difficulty is preparing the data in the in the data warehouse. But when we talk about the data lake, it's easy to upload. The data, like the main difficulty is GDPR policies here. And, uh, but then it's pretty hard to query the data and to build data marts from this query because in data warehouse we have SQL everywhere, but in data lake we need to query our data with some tools like Spark and use Python, Scala, Java, and so on. So it's not so easy and there is no one database to work from. So uh, this part is complicated, more complicated for data lake. So how to make a choice eventually? Here are the list, the points which we can answer to understand do we need a data warehouse or a data lake approach for a company. Data lake approach uh, is suited when we have bounded business domain, domain when a company doesn't build an ecosystem, when a company has only few things to do, but the company do, does it well and doesn't want to do like everything, uh, a lot of new things and also a lot, uh, doesn't have a lot of new analytics 
each month, let's say. Also, data warehouse approach uh, is good when we can predict, predict data usage. So if we won't end up getting like hundreds of new terabytes data in next year. Also, when we prefer waterfall approach over agile, because in data warehouse, we need to work uh, very carefully with requirements and we cannot change requirements pretty often because it depends on how we upload the data into data warehouse. Uh, it affects how we upload the data into data warehouse and if there are unexpected requirements, then our data modeling and normalization can be wrong. Uh, also, if we want to keep things small and simple, especially with our with our data flow, with our SQL queries, and with our analytical logic. Also, if we don't want to buy expensive infrastructure and we want to start just with one database, if we don't want to set up servers, uh, hire admins, DevOps, and so on. Uh, the next point is data warehouse is good when team works mainly with SQL and we don't need engineers which work, which work with Python, Scala, or Java. When uh, we, when we don't have much sources with huge table, huge tables, like terabytes per day, uh, we don't have many daily reports, mainly uh, we don't have much uh, dashboards to uh, build every day, and we don't have much data science R&D, because data science uh, doesn't work. Uh, the, the, data science usually creates too much pressure on this data warehouse databases. So sometimes uh, it's easier to set up a data lake for data, for data science because of cheap resources. So now when we need to choose a data lake, uh, mostly the opposite. When our business domain is expanding, for example, if our business, if our company buys new companies, when we need to constantly load new sources, when we have a lot of different data, and if our company builds some ecosystem. Uh, when we have constantly changing requirements or agile, basically. When our business doesn't want to make a decision for a year, uh, for a year, it just says, I, now I want to monitor this and tomorrow I will want something else. When we have a lot of data to be investigated, so if, if we want to upload a lot of data and deal with it later and perform some, uh, some analysis we don't even know the result of yet, so we just want to experiment, then it's great to have a data lake. Uh, the next point is we can afford expensive infrastructure and DevOps to start from because to work efficiently in data lake we need much more than just one database. Also when our team is ready to use Python, Scala and Java so we have such engineers. Also when we have a lot of huge tables and we can store them easily with, within data lake when we have a lot of daily reports because it will take much more resources and in data lake our resources are cheap. And we have a lot of data science R&D because again, it demands a lot of resources to be taken and usually there is Python, uh, Python it requires Python environments and uh, with data lake, we usually have such environments. And also where well, there is a real data time, uh, real time analytic potential. Of course, it demands some additional setup, but still it's closer to data lake than, rather than uh, data warehouse. So conclusion. Uh, again, in few words, data warehouse are uh, user-friendly environment and have and has some fast SQL, but it demands limiting your data to work convenient in data warehouse, uh, and it makes you pay for poor requirement analysis. So any mistake, and you may want to restructure all your data warehouse. But for data lake, uh, it usually contains complex, unstructured NoSQL data. It, but it fits huge amounts of, it fits huge amount of data and it allows you to focus on today's goal and uh, change your plans almost every day because anytime we can restore all the history and we have all the data already prepared in advance. So that's all. Thanks for your attention and again we invite you to know more about our company on the second floor. So you, you may ask questions in English or Russians, or Russian. Yes. Artem, thank you for the report. Is there 
общие подходы к тестированию от начала процесса, от бизнес, как заходят данные в бизнес веб-сайта, до того, как бизнес их получает на End-to-end -end тестирование от бизнеса, от сайта до дешборда никогда не видел, и это только мануальное тестирование. То есть это всегда только люди между собой. А также всегда в каждом а, я вернусь на самый на картинку с самым большим слайдом. А, и в каждом слое обычно у нас есть свой, свое тестирование, то есть как именно как юнит тестирование, так и интеграционное тестирование. Но end to end тестирование всегда только вручную и всегда только между командами, потому что все, в каждом слое обычно работает своя команда, то есть это одна, одни инженеры работают здесь в бэкенде, одни инженеры в дата лейке и совсем другие инженеры в data warehouse. Поэтому все команды разные, у каждого, у каждой команды свое тестирование и а end to end только когда они взаимодействуют между собой вручную. Еще вопросы? which works on uploading part uh, and if we if there is new column appears in one of backend databases it usually bring it so the uploader changes constantly right uh, right after backend changes uh, and data lakes usually works this way so it's it's all the schema has good evolution so it shouldn't contain breaking changes and if there is any breaking changes so it's also possible just request few additional work for for this team but for 99% cases uh, there is no breaking changes and schema evolution is good within data lake so just new columns appear just new column appears from one period and still uh, it has all the compatibility with previous uh, solutions but yeah again for data warehouse new column sometimes may break all the all the modeling <laughs> right, but uh, I heard about this story uh, with when we bring new column into data warehouse and it ruins all the all the existing data model. And from my understanding, that's why we need data vault version two because this approach should deal with such cases even for data warehouses and normalized table. So data vault version two. Uh, should deal with data evolution pretty well. Right, so, any other question? Yeah. John, thanks for a very interesting presentation. Uh, are there any tools that can combine both approaches? Uh, I mean, if uh, some corporation have uh, has like very complex infrastructure, combining some data in war warehouses, some data in uh, like ordinary databases, can we uh, like combine uh, this data and stream it into some third database or uh, data warehouse like this? Um, oh, what what this, the, the databases you mean? What, what uh, can we combine? I mean if we have uh, different sources of data, some of data is stored into data lakes, some of them is stored into data uh, uh, warehouse, can we uh, combine it and then uh, upload or stream into some uh, third uh, database? Mm. We potentially can, but the question is why? Because if we have data lake and data warehouse, some data in data warehouse and data lake, it's easier to bring the data in one place and then perform our analytics and then to do something with this data. So we can pull our data to data lake usually to perform all the 
to save our resources, uh, to save our, because there are more resources in data lake. So usually we will want to bring the data into data lake, perform an analysis, and then to upload maybe already pre-calculated data in data warehouse again, or in some third system. But if we have data lake already, I think it's easier to upload the data to data lake, all the data to data lake, and perform all the computations here. Mm -hmm. Got it. And what about different databases? For example, we have some data in Oracle, some something in DB2, something in BigQuery. Yeah. Again, again, that's that's when data lake approach is great because we can easily, uh, for example, with Spark or any other uh, tool, we can connect all of this. All we can upload all of the sources to data lake because data lake has cheap resources, has a lot of memory, uh, so we can fit all the data into data lake. Uh, from all the resources we want. And the same idea is mentioned here. So we can have a lot of databases for our backend and we can gather all of the sources into one environment in Data Lake. Because it's, it's not a problem to fit all, all the data in Data Lake. Mm -hmm. Okay, understood. May I ask one, one more question? Uh, like what uh, if we need to deal with uh, real-time computations and um, data like timing, data parsing is very important in terms of time. If we need uh, data quickly. Uh, is there something to do with data warehouses or data lakes here? Um, usually we may want to use the same environment as data lake to perform real-time analytics. We just need a couple of more uh, of more tools for it. So we, we may want to have Kafka and also, so the environment and the servers may be the same as in Data Lake, but we just need few more solutions from open source, uh, like Kafka, Cassandra, and we can use Spark or Flink for uh, operating the data. And usually, so we can use the same servers and the same computation resources from Data Lake, but just bring new, new solutions for operating the data. So it won't be like the same. Uh, it won't. It, it will be the same querying engine like Spark or new querying engine Flink, uh, and except for storage layer like Hadoop S3 and others, we usually may want to use Kafka, Cassandra, but all, we also use uh, technologies like uh, file systems. But it will be a bit slower. But still, uh, if we may want to delay, have a delay, let's say, 30 minutes for for the data, we even can use just Hadoop or S3 or others. But all we need is just Kafka, Spark Streaming, Flink. Oh, yeah, that's, that's what, we, what we need to introduce to build real-time analytics. Okay. Any other question? Okay, I think then we are good. We finished. Thank you. Very much. Thank you.